Okay, I think I'm live. Can everybody hear me? Uh, say hi. There's the camera. Hey, there's people. Um, let me quick say hello to a few folks here. I got to look at a different place. Uh, Janine, what's going on? Beth, Chris, Shankle, good to see you. Um, Michael Debbage, what's happening? Joe. Uh, Melinda, audio is good, Chris says. Okay, um, hopefully we're rocking and rolling here. I'm not going to dawdle too long tonight. I've got, tonight's going to be um, probably longer than normal, and uh, I think we're, it's going to be fun. There's, I've got some fun stuff planned. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Let's see. That's the list of questions I already have. I'm not going to do all of them, but... Um, uh, I'm going to do this a little different. So I'm not going to do any music tonight. It's just going to be all questions. We're going to talk about life on the road. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. For It'll be 25 years in November. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, I've toured with a guy named Michael W. Smith uh, all over the world. He is... Um, Michael's one of the biggest artists in Christian pop music, and uh, he's been doing it for... A long time, um, and I've been along for the ride for the last 20, almost 25 of those years. And um, so I thought what I would do is, because everybody's always asking things about what's it like on the road, what's it like touring around the world, and, and we always get a lot of the same questions. And so I've taken a handful that a lot of you have asked already, and by the way, what you can do... Um, you can comment. I'm going to look later at your comments as they come in, um, so feel free to comment, and, uh, and I'll get back to that. But what I want to do before that is to go through some of these questions that, that we get a lot. I'll answer some of these, then I have a little surprise for you, then I'll get back and uh, check in with everybody and look at some of the live questions that are coming in. So, um, in no particular order, uh, let's see, this is some of the stuff that people are asking. Oops, I accidentally hit my piano. Okay, um, what's your favorite thing to do during free time on tour? Hiking, museums, zip lining, making music videos in the desert? <laughs> um, that's a question we get all the time. You'd be surprised at how little free time there is on the road. And it, and it, it kind of depends on a couple things. Um, if it's a typical bus tour, uh, like we do in the in the United States, um, much of the time when we're on a tour bus, excuse me, you do have a, a good bit of free time in those cases. But when you're traveling by air, uh, a lot of times, if it's if uh, when we used to do a lot of summer festival dates, in those cases, we'd fly in sometimes uh, that day, uh, get there at somewhere around lunchtime, go have lunch. Do a quick, um, you know, setup, sound check, and there's very little free time in those cases. And then there's the times when you're on the road in another part of the world. Um, call that planes, trains, and automobiles and tour buses. In those cases, I'll, I'll, you'll see it in a little bit. Um, there's very little free time because it's all taken up with traveling. So uh, I'm going to dispel the myth of. Uh, how people think there's a lot of glitz and glamour to being on tour. Um, that hour and a half of the day that you see with all the lights and all the cool stuff, there's another 22 and a half hours of the day. <laughs> and I'm going to show you a little behind the scenes of that here in a little bit. So uh, when, when we do have time, there's, yeah, people do all kinds of different things. We all have our different things that we like. Uh, James Gregory, who plays bass, James is, we call him the professor. He, he will tend to find a museum or something like that. Um, others like to go shopping. Uh, a certain boss, who I won't name, uh, likes to go shopping. Um, I tend to always be working on music projects, so I'm usually holed up with a laptop somewhere. Uh, just, so it just depends. There's, there, you know, it depends on your personality. Um, jumping through here. Uh, da, 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 da. Somebody asked, do you do a lot of uh, soldering and repair on cables when they wear down and get broken during a tour. So, do you take care of your own gear? Um, most guys tend to have a dedicated tech that works for them. 
Um, and I, I have, we, we have one guy usually the last couple of years who kind of does a little bit of everything. Personally for me, because I'm so OCD with my gear, I can honestly say, I don't think I've ever had a cable go bad. It, they either tend to work or they don't. And I baby all my stuff so much that the chances are pretty small that something of mine's gonna go bad. It just doesn't, if you take care of your stuff, it's not something you really have to worry about. But yes, uh, I tend to be my own tech when it comes to building my keyboard gear, my, my we call it a rig. When I build my rig, um, I, I'm very technically minded, so I like to do all my own stuff. Um, but we do have a crew who, who tends to set everything up for us, and then I usually come in and kind of finish the job, set up my computer and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see. What are some of the best ways you found at keeping in touch uh, and the sparkle of love in your marriage when the two of you are on the road frequently. Uh, this is fun because, as most of you guys know, uh, my wife Anita also travels with an artist named Tammy Trent. And when we first met and, and started dating, um, there was a little while where early on I thought, man, this, this might not work because if we're both gone all the time, you know, we'll never see each other. But we really kind of thought through it and... Um, we tend to be gone uh, around the same times. Um, Anita and Tammy only do um, weekends for the most part. And so that's, you know, when we're out, we're usually out on weekends as well. So it kind of works out. And the other part of that question is every relationship is different. Um, I was never a texting guy. I, I hated texting, actually, <laughs> when I met Anita. And I was just always, a, 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 you know, phone guy and um so that's another thing when we when we started dating and she just is not a phone talker so at first that that was kind of a, a thing for me i thought well how's that gonna work because i want to talk to her every day um and then i realized the upsides of texting you know and and so we we definitely um for our relationship um we text throughout the day sometimes constantly and we'll we send each other goofy little notes and and um so there, there there's ways of doing that and uh also thankfully because michael is not a he's not an artist that tends to be gone for weeks at a time um that tends to work well for marriages um if i was you know like a lot of country acts i got called to play for a major country act when she was just getting started years ago and um I asked what the travel would be like, and they said, oh, it's, it's usually about anywhere from six weeks to, to three months gone at a time. And I, not for me. Couldn't do that. I, I love my family too much, and um, so I, that's just not something I could do. Okay, um, jump back and forth. Just want to see who else here. Want to say hi to some more people. Um, oh, and I lost... Oh, there you are. Okay, Amy Etner. Oh, Amy, you chose wisely. Good to see you. Uh, Calvin, how are you? Steve Hudgens, uh, Carolyn Shield, Jim Steinman, Dan Wilcott. Hey, 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 Nancy Anderson, um, Peter Hartzell, what's going on? Steve McClure, Melinda Johnson, I think I said hi to you before. Okay. Uh, just want to say hi. I'm going to jump back into some more questions, then I'll come back to, to you guys. Um, you are fa This is a common question. Uh, you are faced with numerous hardware and software failures in the middle of a show. Uh, what one bit of gear do you fall back on? Uh, how do you handle that? So on and so forth. Uh, you know, I... My responsibility is kind of running as musical director and keyboard player. I kind of run the show as far as um, I run the computer and the computer runs the show. Um, it sends out signals that let us all synchronize to each other or click tracks so that we, you know, because we're using things like video and lighting that has to synchronize with what the band is playing. There's a lot of stuff behind the scenes. Like I'm wearing in-ear monitors right now. We use those on stage so that we can uh, all play together. And um, so when when you run a show as big as Smitty's, where sometimes we're playing arenas or even stadiums, you can't take chances. Things have to work. And um, so a big part of that is setting up the gear the right way in the first place. 
And um, there's a lot that you have to know to, to build a computer system for live touring so that it's reliable and rock solid. And I can honestly say, um, when you do that right, you're just really not gonna experience much in the way of, of uh, failures. Have we had little things over the years? Of course. Um, but generally, there's part of being a professional is just learning how to go with the flow when that stuff happens. Uh, I'll give you a disaster scenario. A couple years ago, we were in Nigeria. And uh, so, of course, the infrastructure wasn't what we're typically used to. Um, and it was in a church where there was no... Um, there was no secure. Well, actually, there was security, but there there wasn't the typical barrier between the stage and the crowd, and so um, it was kind of what you would expect. It it just um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think how to explain it. Put it this way: um, all the power. You know, typically on a big show, you have dedicated power brought in so that your stage and lighting and band equipment and sound and all that it all is isolated from everything else. Well, in this particular place, it was a lot of band-aids and duct tape to try and get this show to even happen. So we're maybe five, six songs in, and all of a sudden, all the power to stage just went away. And uh, we're thinking, okay, what now? What, what do we do? Um, Stu, Stu G from Delirious, in his former life, before his rock star days, he was an electrician. So this is hilarious. Stu was crawling around on the stage with a screwdriver trying to, to work on electrical things because he, he was trying to help. Meanwhile, Michael just grabbed an acoustic guitar and started playing Majesty, which is a song that Stu wrote. So Stu's on the ground trying to <laughs> fix electrical stuff. I'm trying to figure out the, the computer stuff, and it, it was a nightmare. So once in a blue moon, that stuff does happen. But um, usually it, when it's a, you know, a proper you know, show environment where, where, you know, all the right gear is brought in. That's, you know, sure, there's always going to be things. Those of you who've seen the movie Spinal Tap, you know that that is completely true to life. It's, it's a mockumentary, but it is very much uh, an accurate portrayal of so much of what goes on the, on the road. So you just have to be prepared. And you're a professional. When, when things go wrong, um, you just handle it. Sometimes, you know, Michael's had problems where his keyboard wouldn't work all of a sudden, or his pedal, his sustained pedal. So he'll just grab a guitar and go out front and, and you know, do something. Michael's a master at that, um, covering for, for stuff like that. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, what is your role in Michael's recordings? Just keyboards, recording, mixing, writing, background vocals, etc. It depends. Um, one of the downsides of being a keyboard player is that when Michael's in the studio, he doesn't really need me uh, for keyboards. He can play it himself. So I tend to get called when he wants maybe another perspective uh, on something. Or um, I'm definitely on the live albums, of course, you know, Worship and Worship Again and Surrounded and Awaken, um, because that's those are captures of, of a live event. Um, but yeah, I've done many things over the years, like the, the two Cracker Barrel albums, the exclusive albums we did that are hymns albums. Um, I produced half of each of those records. Kyle Lee did the other half. So in those cases, I did tons of stuff, uh, all the keyboard parts and arranging and writing string arrangements and background vocals, um, recording, engineering, uh, dealing with all the, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see, what else? I'll make sure everything's still going. A um, couple more things. What? Uh, ta -ta -ta. Oh, people are always asking, can you do a tour of your keyboard rig? Um, unfortunately, I can't at the moment because we're not on the road. So maybe this, when, whenever we get it back out, summer or fall, hopefully we get back out there. And, um, and then I will do a proper walkthrough video because I, I have changed it up completely right before the uh, the tour that we were supposed to be doing right now. So um, Janine asked, do you and the band bring some of your own, excuse me, instruments when you travel overseas? Have they ever gotten lost in flight? Yes and yes. Um, we tend to bring our own stuff, except for keyboards, because those are big and heavy. 
Uh, but, you know, the guitar guys, bass, they bring their own in a usually a gig bag that goes in overhead. Um, but there's also, of course, usually a bunch of cases that fly, you know, in checked baggage, uh, microphones and, and um, my pedal board, which goes with my keyboards and stuff like that. Yeah, you hope and pray that that stuff doesn't get lost. And sure, certainly there have been times when things like that happen and you have to figure it out. I try to carry backups of all my... Um, my main things in my carry-on bag, uh, just in case. And there have been times I've had to rely on that. Um, so that can be a nightmare. Uh, Catherine Stark, what happens if two or more people don't get along on the tour? Who stays and who goes and who gets to decide? Well, <laughs> first and foremost, um, when you work for somebody like Michael, you're, you're generally not going to that stuff tends to get vetted ahead of time. Um, people always ask, this is another question, does Michael ever have auditions? Uh, you know, I want to play drums for Michael. How do I do that? Well, no, Michael really doesn't do auditions because he doesn't need to. Um, he's at the top, and so it tends to be word of mouth. If, that, uh, if a need like that ever comes up, first thing he'll usually do is he'll ask people that he's working with at the time. He'll usually ask the rest of the band, hey, do you who's, you know, who do you know? Um, you know, he'll ask for recommendations from from you know people in his inner circle. Um, but it doesn't really happen that you get people who don't get along. It, it, you know, I mean, there's little things here and there, little personality things that can happen once in a while. That uh, in all my years, it's been extremely rare that that stuff like that has happened. And it it just it tends to work itself out. Um, it's probably the best way to say it. Um, how do you rehearse on the road? Um, how easy is it to handle when band members do change? Uh, so on and so forth. What if somebody needs a day off and someone else jumps in to cover? Is there backup? Do you have people on call? So on. Okay, as far as rehearsals, I think people would be surprised. We don't really rehearse much. Um, unless it's something like a Christmas tour when we typically will block out uh, two to four days at a place called Soundcheck up in Nashville, and uh, then those are very long days, you know, typically uh, nine in the morning till six or seven at night. Um, when we're lucky, we get to record out, or excuse me, rehearse out at Michael's Farm, which is glorious because it's, those of you who've been there know, it, there's a huge stone fireplace, and it's it's very warm and cozy, and, and uh, but other than that, you know, maybe at the beginning of a touring season, the you know, beginning of the year, we'll do a day or two of rehearsal. But at, at this level, you're expected to just know your stuff. So I'll, I'll typically send out reference tracks for everybody. Um, if, if there's a new arrangement of something, uh, if Michael's done a new album and we're starting to, to tour some of that material, um, I'll send that out so everybody can kind of listen and learn their parts. And then we show up and we work it out for a day or two. But once we've done that and we hit the road, we'll usually do um, sound checks for the first couple days, uh, sometimes all the way through a tour, and they tend to get shorter throughout the tour. And it's usually just because it, um, it's not for us, it's usually for the crew because every room is different. So they need to hear how, how are things going to sound in this room. And, and um, so it gives them a chance to dial things in a little bit. But the, the caliber of musicians that Michael hires, you really don't need to rehearse much. So uh, let's see here, unless, jumping back, uh, we call Michael the King of Wing. He gets a wild idea, which happens often, um, and he'll decide he wants to do a new arrangement of something. And so then, you know, of course, we'll have to work that stuff out, usually with very little time to spare. And uh, sometimes there have, been, there have been times where we'll just walk on stage. We didn't even rehearse something. He'll just say, hey, let's, let's cut eight bars out of this section or whatever, and you just got to remember it. So that can be fun. Um, let's see. Is Michael different in rehearsal? Does he crack the whip? Michael, especially when, like I was talking about, when we're when we're on the farm rehearsing out there, we kind of joke that uh, you'll be in the middle of rehearsing, and Michael's nowhere to be found because all of us. It's usually it's in the fall if it's before Christmas he'll get an idea. He wants to go for a walk. And so all of a sudden, Michael's nowhere to be found. <laughs> so usually we got to kind of keep him reined in. And um, Michael's a very short attention span. So we kind of joke that it's like, 
you know, uh, herding turtles, uh, herd, H-E-R-D, not T, um, you know, because it's just, we'll do a song and then people get up, somebody will go up to, you know, start munching on snacks and then one by one, everybody's gone. And so it, it can be interesting. Um, uh, okay. Last one. Then I'm going to jump over to you guys. This is a great question. Uh, two, uh, sorry, two more questions. Sonny asked, since I can get virtually any music I want on YouTube for free, and Michael's been doing these online concerts every weekend, how do you all get paid for that? Um, back in the days of records, there used to be royalties. Okay, this could be a whole other topic. Um, bottom line is, for, the, for, the, for YouTube and stuff like these online things, nobody gets paid for that. That's something that we're doing right now just to kind of give back and spend time with fans because we're not getting to go out on the road. Um, Michael has a huge heart, and so he's he's just trying to be generous. And obviously it's hitting um, a really important need because those streams he's doing are, usually they're in the millions. Um, now, YouTube, you can get paid for for stuff on YouTube, but you have it, ha it would have to stream millions and millions of streams. Even then, you're not gonna make a living uh, on YouTube, uh, unless you're getting into the tens of millions of things and, and that, but that's very rare. Um, so ideally, I think, especially right now, nobody knows when we're going to get back out on the road. There are, there are governors and, and, uh, government officials who are saying we might not see live shows again for another year, which would, that would be insane if that happens. Hopefully it doesn't. But, um, God forbid, if, if that does happen, I think you're going to see a lot of people moving these streaming things to a monetized platform. Um, not so much these informal things like this or, or the things that Michael's doing, but uh, yeah, I mean, if people want to stay afloat, I mean, every musician I know is out of work right now. All the, the, the crew, the truck drivers, band dr bus drivers, um, caterers, all the, all the peripheral people involved in, in live entertainment, they are in a world of hurt right now. So um, it's a scary time. So in, in some ways, we don't know. We don't know how this is going to pan out. Um, we are going to have to figure out a way to move things to a platform where, where artists can get paid for their work because music is, sadly, the expectation has become that it's free and it's not free. Um, it costs a fortune to do music at a professional level. It just does. And um, so there's there's things that we're, we're looking at, trying to figure that out. I don't think anybody has the answer yet, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if somebody starts, you're going to start seeing it. I, I know that there's a couple major acts that are doing um, kind of pay for play uh, events and it'll be very inexpensive. Uh, I think Brian White did one last night. Um, I think he charged five dollars. So people got a Brian White concert for five dollars. And so we'll see what the market will bear. But it's it's tricky. I always tell people, you know, if you're a music lover and you really do care uh, about artists, go buy their music while you still can on iTunes. You know, go go. Don't, yeah, people love Spotify and whatever. Personally, I hate it because I feel like they steal from artists. Um, artists really don't get paid much of anything uh, for, for streaming their music on Spotify or any of the streaming platforms. So the only way to really support artists is buy their music. Um, when we were still traveling, when people could go do live shows, then yeah, you could you could buy their CDs and and stuff like that. Until that starts happening again, nobody knows. Last question. Um, have you ever had fans that were a bit too close? Any stalkers? <laughs> what do you do? That's rare, but yeah, once in a while there can be folks that just kind of don't really have boundaries and they're a little needy and um, uh, I don't know how much I should or shouldn't say about that. It's it's rare and it's really not my department So because it's, it's not like it really happens to me, but... Um, yeah, I, I remember one time being backstage with Michael and it, there was a meet and greet going on and there was a fan who was just, could not contain themselves, themselves, that person's self. I don't want to say him or her, but uh, this person ran after Michael and tackled him. And uh, 
that's not good. You, it, you just can't do that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, that, that's that's a little tricky. But, uh, I, and I, I think the only other thing I'd say about that is, you know, we did, you know, we've done the cruises how many times now over the years? Before we ever did the first one, I think Michael was a little concerned, like, you know, what's it going to be like to get on a boat with a couple hundred fans and, and you know, are they going to respect, you know, boundaries and, you know, am I going to be able to get away? And, of course, it turned out to be wonderful. And, um, you know, those things are a blast. And so it's that's really not an issue. Um, pretty much everybody that, that we come into contact with, they're there to... Um, to be moved and taken on an, uh, an emotional and spiritual journey, and and you know hopefully we do that. And people are very respectful, so it's it's um, it can be entertaining though. So okay, so I'm gonna jump over and see what kind of questions you guys are asking, and um, and then we'll wrap up with a little surprise. So let me scroll up and see what I'm missing. Um, oh, let's see. I gotta figure out where. Okay, here we go. Um, sorry, one second. I can't really see. Um, a spinal tap reference. Yep. Um, Calvin, good question. So we know that your rig is pretty reliable, but what about an actual backup? Um, again... This is going to sound crazy to some people, but the only backup I carry is a backup of my um, my show hard drive. Um, because several people on the tour have the same computer I do, if God forbid I would have, if my computer were to fall or something uh, and not be able to boot up, I would be able to instantly boot from, a, from an up-to-date clone drive and be up and running instantly. So... Um, that's the extent of it. It, it, it. Really, when when your rig is professionally dialed in, you're just not going to have issues. Um, it now it does take extensive testing, and I run through things over and over. I make sure everything is rock solid. Um, it's just not something you're really going to have a problem with. Uh, so let's see what else. Um, uh, How did I get started in all of this? Um, T.P. Shimmons, I think, asked that. I kind of answered that last week. If you go on, um, I'll, I'll, I'll post a link then. Um, but the one I did last week, I kind of talked about that. Long story short, I just knew that I belonged in Nashville. And um, I was working in music retail, running a keyboard department at a big music store in um, New Jersey. I lived in Pennsylvania, but I, I worked at this place just over the border from me. This would have been in 1992, three, um, excuse me, 93, 94. And then I moved to Nashville in 95. Um, this is a long story, but I'm just keeping it short. I had been sending resumes to Michael's management office that entire summer. I moved in May of 95 and they called in November of 95 and I got the, the job. But at the time, it wasn't to play. It was to run the computer system. I'm going to show you something here in a minute that'll explain that. So I did that for the first year. I, I ran the, the computer stuff, uh, which was at the time, it was a massive rig, all these uh, computers and keyboards everywhere. And so it was my job to do all that. That uh, After that first year, uh, the guy that was playing keyboards uh, left. So of course there was an opportunity and I just told Michael, I said, um, by that time he knew I could play. So I just said, could I give it a shot? Could I... Uh, I can run the show, I can design a computer system so that I can run it from stage and play at the same time. And uh, he said, sure, let's give it a shot, which was a pretty big leap of faith for him at that time. And uh, that was 24 years ago. So it obviously worked out. Sometime I'll tell you all the details, but that's the, the short version. Um, okay, let me see what else. Yeah, interesting about not rehearsing much. Yeah, again, at, at this level, guys, you'd be shocked. These musicians are so good, they just show up and they know their stuff. So it's just a matter of putting it together, which, again, we do rehearse, but not 
Not like a lot of people would think. Um, Sonny also asks, you were heavily involved in the 35 Years show. Talk to us about that. Uh, that was just about a year ago now. Um, so the idea behind that was it was Michael's 35th anniversary of his career, and they wanted to do a big concert uh, honoring him. And um, it was going to be pulling in all these guest artists. I think there ended up being 55 or 60 guest artists, everybody from Amy Grant, Vince Gill, Stephen Curtis Chapman, um, Bill Gaither, uh, a Backstreet Boy, I mean, you name it. It was a who's who of music. But the trick was, it was all supposed to be a surprise for Michael. They, they wanted him to come on stage and sit there and observe this whole thing with, with Debbie, with his wife. And so it was my job to put it all together, which was incredibly fun because I got to, for the first time in all these years, I really got to build a show without Michael's input. Um, he only heard maybe one or two little snippets of things, but here's the funny thing. He was like a kid at Christmas. He knew what we were doing. Um, and so I was working on this while we were on tour last year. And so I would set up my little mobile studio in, in dressing rooms, locker rooms, usually in an arena. And I'd be working most of the time with headphones, but sometimes I'd have little speakers and, um, I'd be laying these parts down, doing these arrangements. And, uh, Michael would come walking in uh, or we'd catch him outside the door, uh, eavesdropping a little bit trying to, to piece together what we were doing. So that was fun. And it ended up being an incredible night. Just, I think he was moved incredibly to, to tears a few times at some of the stuff that, that the guest artists did. And um, that was a career highlight for me because at the end of the night, um, I didn't, of course, I didn't expect this, but Michael turned around and he, he said, I couldn't have done this without Jim, who's been with me all these years. And all 60 or whatever of these artists all turned around and, and kind of gave me a nod. And, and I mean, that was a moment I'll never forget because I'm like, my gosh, half these people are people I grew up listening to. And so the, I have pinch me moments like that all the time. Um, so that was that was definitely a highlight. Uh, what else? What else? Um, uh, sorry, guys. I, I, it's hard to see both these things at one time. Um, does the set list change much over the course of a tour? It, it depends on the tour. Um, it always does change uh, some to some degree. But if it's a tour like we've done for the last year where uh, it's kind of the 35 we, uh, years of friends, it's called, which actually came out of that show that we did. Um, it's all the, you know, stuff from his past, these hits, um, Sometimes some of that stuff will change, but because that's such a, a production-heavy show with a lot of video and lighting and all that, the 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 main outline of the show doesn't change. But there are there are parts here and there that will change. Other tours, um, yeah, it, it can change quite a bit. Um, and he'll bring, you know, Michael's just so super creative. He he just gets bored with things being the same every night. So he's always looking for some way to change it up a little bit. So. Um, it does. It does change. Um, let's see. A couple more questions, and then we'll we'll kind of start wrapping up. Ooh, Amy Etner. What about if you get sick on the road? How is that handled? Oh, yeah. So that has happened. I'll never forget uh, a Christmas tour a couple years ago. There was a virus that started going around. And in fact, I think I was patient zero, if I remember. Um I didn't really know it. <laughs> so I think I was the first, though. I, I I hadn't been sick, like flu kind of sick and all that goes with that since high school. So it had been like 25 years, whatever, since I'd been sick like that. So I got it. I think I came in. It was the first day of the tour. I tried to stay away from everybody, but it was, it was like a 24, 48-hour bug. Next thing you know, people started dropping like flies. And um, we ended up leaving... We would leave people in that city to, to, so that they could stay in a hotel room and recuperate because it would knock you out. And um, I think the last guy to get it was James Gregory, the guy that plays bass. And so uh, I think we got pretty pretty fortunate because most people that would get it would be you know be like a crew guy or something, so they would stay, and that doesn't make quite as much difference. Um, but when it's somebody that's on stage, they, yeah, that's a big deal. And 
heaven forbid, if Michael gets sick. Um, so, uh, yeah, James missed the last show of the Christmas tour that year. So that afternoon, I had to quick scurry and program James's bass parts um, so that we would have a, a bass player, even though James couldn't be there. So that's that's very rare, but yeah, that can happen too. Um, ooh, go-to bus movies. Kyle Dutton. Okay, every tour, it's a tradition that um, we watch... It's my favorite movie, Tombstone. There's just no better bus movie uh, to me than Tombstone. And everybody kind of laughs because I can recite that movie from beginning to the very last frame in character with proper dialect. And uh, those of you who know me well know I've got a lot of voices in my head and some of them I listen to. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, so to, the, everybody laughs because my favorite character is Doc Holliday played by um, Val Kilmer. And uh, I could, I could, yeah, I can recite all that. There's others though. Um, of course, uh, anytime there's a Star Wars movie on, I mean, it's stuff like that. Um, Shawshank Redemption. I mean, there's, there's how many classic movies are there? Um, you know, Michael's always big about bringing in something new that we haven't seen. He'll get screeners a lot of the time that that aren't out yet. So sometimes we'll see stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's. Uh, that can be fun. Um, what else? Jason Sheffer. Hey, bro. My Canadian buddy. Good to see you. Um, uh, let's see. Sorry. Still trying to see these questions. Um, Uh, Carolyn Shield, what feature of the tour bus might might surprise us? Um, do you have trouble coming down after a performance? I think you mean emotionally. Uh, or are you exhausted enough to... Oh, I see what you mean. Or are you exhausted enough to fall right asleep? Okay, what features of a tour bus might surprise you? Um, I don't have any great pictures, unfortunately. I, I went back and looked through my years of pictures. I don't really have any uh, of the inside of a tour bus. Um, they're very nice, uh, as you would expect, because you got to live on them for sometimes weeks at a time in close quarters. Typically, it's it's like a glorified RV, um, but kind of a professional version of an RV. When you walk on, usually there's a, a kitchen area and a lounge. There's usually a, two, a couch on each side of the bus. So, you know, half of you sit on one side, half of you sit on the other, and you end up looking at each other, or these days you end up looking at your phones. Um, and there's usually a kitchen area right behind that. Um, it does get a little claustrophobic, especially the, the more people you have on the bus. I think this last Christmas tour we had uh, usually about 10 people, which can be a lot. And then after the kitchen area, it's like a submarine in the middle of the bus, and there's a door there that separates it because some people go right to bed, some people don't. Um, there's de there's definitely the the um, the night owls. Um, there's other people who they just can't hang. They 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 get off the off the, the stage, the girls, some of the girls take their makeup off and they just go right to bed. Um, the boys, we tend to stay up and, and uh, yeah, have bus food, have nachos, you know, whatever. We try to eat healthy. Um, but uh, sometimes, with, you know, a lot of guys like to watch a movie or whatever afterward. Um, but anyway, so there's the bunk area. Um, usually there's uh, four to six bunks on one side and then four to six on the other and then there's another door and then there's a back lounge um, which is kind of smaller and there's a separate TV and entertainment system back there and um, so they're, they're great I mean it's you do find that after the end of a tour you're, you're ready to get off of the bus um, so uh, but yeah as far as do you have trouble coming down after a performance again it just depends on 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 who you are. Um, I, I don't. I, I love after the show because we're usually hungry. We've worked for, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, and, and um, so you're ready to usually nibble a little bit. Um, so, let's see, a couple more. Um, how long? 
Steve McClure, how long did it take to video Stereo Phoenix? Uh, I think you mean how long did it take to, to do the video for that for the first Stereo Phoenix song? Um, actually, we're gonna another night. I'm gonna talk more about music projects. But just to answer your question, um, we actually did. We worked on that song over the course of a year, in between other things. So I got a couple little pieces of footage in November of. 2018 and got the rest of it around November, December of 2019 and then did all the video editing in January, uh, this just a couple months ago. Um, video takes forever. It's very, very time consuming. Um, oh, let's see what else. Uh, Amy, I've been mocked for buying CDs, but I still do. Bought multiple copies of Adalta. Bless you, my friend. Um, it's because of people like you that we can still do what we do. Uh, so I would never mock you. I would encourage everybody to buy the music that you like. Um, nothing wrong with streaming it, but honestly, that doesn't really pay any bills. So yeah, if you can buy music, your artist friends would greatly appreciate it. Um, Ken Parton, will more Ad Alta CDs be available again? Um, maybe at some point. Probably not until I do another project because you can typically only print uh, big bulk orders of a thousand or more. And I can't afford to go, you know, spend whatever it is, $2,500 or whatever to print a thousand or I forget what the math is. It's actually more than that. Um, it costs a fortune. And right now there's not enough demand. You know, people aren't calling and asking for physical copies. They can buy it on, on iTunes. So... The next big project I do, I'll probably do another run then because at that point, my hope is to go out and tour um, an actual Jim Daniker show um, that'll incorporate Ad Alta. And so I'm going to want to sell CDs. So until then, probably not going to do physical copies. It just There's just not much, not much market for it right now. Um, I hope you never retire. Well, I don't think any of us ever will retire. We love what we do too much. Uh, okay couple more. Let's see what time is it. I know we're going to go longer tonight, which is okay. I think this is fun. Um, Calvin, what are some things you experienced during a tour that other people might not know? Ah, that's a tough one. I'm trying to think. I, that probably gets into um, experiences, you know, that when we do have some time off. Um, it can be grueling. Touring is not easy. It's it can be a very um, grueling experience, but uh, it can also be very re rewarding, especially when it's somebody like Smitty, because you you tend to get well taken care of. And and um, I tell you what, I was very fortunate. I skipped the whole um, being in a well, actually, it's not entirely true. I was going to say I skipped the the driving around in a fifteen passenger van phase of my career. But I actually did, uh, um, in high school and, and the little bit of college that I did, um, me and a couple buddies had a band, uh, and we would travel around in my parents' minivan playing uh, at churches, you know, youth group events and stuff like that, and we actually did pretty well. It was, it was fun, but that was an adventure when you're, you know, 18 to 21, 22, but when it goes beyond that, and, you know, and you're like a young band, and you're starving, and you're living out of a van, pfft, no, thank you. I'm so glad I didn't do any of that. Um, so I, in that sense, I was very fortunate. My parents and my family used to kind of laugh when I said I wanted to move to Nashville and work for Michael W. They all said, you know, you better have a backup plan because it's probably not going to happen. And I, again, thank God it did because I, I was one of the very, very few people that I moved to Nashville and I, I paid my dues for a couple months. I drove a truck around the country for DC Talk, setting up band gear and I would work during the day and I would drive at night and it was brutal. But um, at, looking back, it was fun. It was an adventure. And um, and, and then I, run, I ran sound for, for a month or two for a guy named Mark Lowry. And, uh, and the next thing you know, I was working for Michael W. And, and um, for me, that was like hitting the, the lottery. So um, yeah, so let's see what else. A um, couple more. Uh, how do you? 
gosh, it's so hard to find. Every time I look at something, it, it, it Facebook comments jump, so I'm trying to follow along. Um, uh, what music industry? Joe Huang, what music industry co and concert touring flaws would you like to see resolved? Um... I can't really think of any off the top of my head. Um, it, you know, it's it really comes down to feeling like people are taking care of you, um, and sometimes there are there are promoters who don't. Again, thankfully that's rare. But uh, there was one show. I think it was only maybe a year or two ago, and I'm not going to say where it was, but it was kind of in the middle of nowhere, and um, I think it was a church maybe, and. Um, catering uh you know it's you're you're completely dependent on people to you know and we have riders you know you'll send out a rider that specifies okay you should have you know uh some sort of meat you know and then vegetables and salad and you know, water to drink and you know maybe iced tea or whatever so you have this thing it's called a rider you send that out it's part of the contract um sometimes people just ignore those and whether it's equipment that they're supposed to provide They'll just provide something altogether different and they'll say, uh, well, we thought that would work. That doesn't work. You have to do what the writer says. That's a legal contract. Um, and anyway, so this church, the only thing that they provided for us to eat was baked salmon uh, that had been baked about 10 times too long. So it was completely dry, little salmon fillets that tasted like cardboard and there was nothing else to eat. There was not a green vegetable in sight. There was no side uh, and just water. That was it. I'm like, oh, okay. We're just, <laughs> so again, that's rare, but stuff like that. And, but you know, again, it's, that's pretty rare. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Stephen Gould, you may have gone over this uh, yeah, I'll talk about this another time. He's asking about streaming. What camera am I using? Um, long short. Long story short, I'm using a, uh, just one tonight, but a pair of um, Panasonic uh, G7s. It's the um, GH4 uh, family, and uh, into a Roland video streaming mixer. It's called a VR1HD, and then all of that goes into. Um, OBS software, and I mix everything together there. Uh, and then audio is coming out of Logic. I run my microphone and, and um, can, uh, you know, music, all that stuff comes from Logic. So I'll, I'll go into more on that later. Um, okay, maybe just two, two, three things here more, and then I'm, we're going to wrap up, and I'm going to do something else for you. Uh, ooh, what about relationships? Are there written or unwritten rules contractual or otherwise around relationships with other musicians within the group on tour. Um, that kind of doesn't really come up because um, Michael, that's just a matter of who he hires. Um, you know, he's, you're, yeah, I don't even know really how to answer that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just really, a, it's a non-issue. I mean, once in a while we'll have, like, you know, right now, the last two years, uh, Vanessa, uh, is a single girl. Um, she she's in a long term relationship. She's dating a, a guy, and who uh, they live in separate cities. Um, uh, but it, you know, pretty much everybody else is usually married. Um, and uh, we're trying to um, we're trying to encourage Vanessa uh, because uh, well, anyway, I'm not going to get into that. She we we love her to to death, and. Um, uh, so we give her a hard time, but yeah, it's there's really not um, an issue with that. Once in a while, like on the, you know, on some tours, you know, you'll have a, um, I just lost my train of thought. Anyway, yeah, it's it's it's. You would think that'd be an issue, but it's it's really not. Just because Michael tends to hire, um, it's it's almost always guys, and we're all married, and um, so. Yeah, I mean, and, and Michael's big on things being appropriate. So, um, and we're we're all ca cautious of of that as well. Like we, you know, kind of the the Billy Graham rule, you know, of, of generally not uh, ever being alone, you know, in, in a situation where you shouldn't be, stuff like that. That's just kind of a given. So, um, yeah, that kind of tends to take care of itself. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> I'd come to a Jim Daneker show in multiple cities. Well, I'm hoping, you know, the next dream for me is definitely um, I'm working towards it. I, I hope to, to do my own thing. That doesn't mean I'm leaving. I'm not going anywhere. But I definitely have some ideas. So, uh, okay. Maybe one or two. I know I've said this a couple times now. Um, how long does it take you to set up a show? Say the show's at 7 p.m. What do you start? What time do you start setting up the stage? Well, the crew travels separately, and so those guys work uh, unbelievably hard. They are first in and last out. On a big show, if it's an arena uh, and there's you know lighting that gets hung from the ceiling and all that, it's an all-day affair. Those guys will start sometime between six and eight in the morning. Uh, they work all the way through. The, you know, they'll get a lunch break, of course. And then um, usually it has to be ready by, um, excuse me, uh, two, three o'clock in the afternoon. So they'll get a little break while we sound check, some of them, but the, the sound guys don't because they've got to do their jobs. They, they mix our, our monitors. And uh, so it's a long day for those guys. They are the unseen heroes of the touring industry. And then after we leave the stage, they got to pack everything up, which that goes a lot faster. Um, but that can take anywhere from, on the low end, uh, an hour, hour and a half if it's a smaller show. Um, to an arena show, it can take three hours. To, to, so yeah, those guys get very little sleep and they, they work their tails off. Um, uh, <laughs> Michelle Moyer Carls. Yes, uh, she says, one of my favorite memories of you after a Michael's uh, concert, this is a fun story. Um, the, this was over 20 years ago. This would have been... What she's talking about was the Change Your World show, which was 1992. Um, we were the last ones in the parking lot. I broke down in tears. She's talking about me. I broke down in tears because I wanted to tour with Michael in the worst way. Uh, look how far you've come. I couldn't be happier for you. Yes, that's very sweet. Um, yeah, so the deal is, uh, that uh, yeah, that was 1992. I, I knew in eighth grade what I wanted to do. Uh, I had gone to see Amy Grant, uh, her um, Lead Me On tour, which was in 1988. So 88, 89, 90, 91, 92. So only five years between when I'd seen Michael live for the first time, he was opening for Amy. And then, um, so when I got out of high school, I, st I was sending resumes to Michael's management office while I was still in high school, as if they were going to take me out of high school to let me tour. Didn't really think that through, but that's how bad I wanted to do it. And um, I, I just knew. I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And um, so uh, went with a bunch of friends from our church youth group, and um, I snuck in. We, we it's my friends and I, um, we went, to, this would have been Hershey Arena in Pennsylvania, near where I lived, went down in the afternoon and kind of snuck in so that I could, I was just fascinated with this stuff. Watching, you know, sound check, it wasn't really a sound check, uh, um, but they were playing the show from the night before and some of the band guys were there and uh, the guy that was playing keyboards on that tour, he was standing right in front of me and he was talking about how um, he, he had made a mistake the night before and he felt awful or whatever. And I'm thinking, this is my life dream. I want to do this so bad. And here I am standing right behind the guy that had the job that I wanted. And so we saw the show and, and we walked out, you know, like Michelle says, and we were standing in the parking lot. And I did. I broke down in tears because I'm like, I wanted that so badly. And uh, three years later, uh, I, I got the job. And it's I really feel like, again, not to over-spiritualize things, but I think God put that dream in me at such a long or at such an early age <clears throat> excuse me, and um, it just propelled me and it made me extremely tenacious for, for those in between years. And um, yeah, it was it was tough to go. And, and of course, I was fascinated and I was, I was in awe of watching the show as a fan on the front row and taking it all in. And that was the last time. That was the last time I saw the show from a fan perspective. 
And there's a part of me that misses that because it, George Lucas, when he made Star Wars, talked about that, you know, to, to a moviegoer, it's magic when you see a movie like Star Wars, especially as a kid. But when you're on the other side of it, that magic is gone uh, because you're seeing you're seeing it behind the curtain. And um, so, yeah, I, I love what I get to do. And um, certainly I, I, would, I wouldn't trade it for anything. But to a degree, that magic, it, I'll never have that again. Um, and so the last time I saw what I, got, what I get to do from a fan perspective was 1992. And um, I try to keep that in my head of what that felt like so that I can try and deliver a show that, that does that for other people. So thank you, Michelle. That, that means a lot. Um, okay. All right. We're really going along here. So anything else? Um, uh, no, I didn't live in Hershey. Sonny asked if I lived in Hershey. I didn't live there. I lived in um, Allentown at the time, but uh, Hershey was the closest that we could go. Other than one time, or one or two times, when Michael would play at Stabler Arena in Bethlehem, uh, which is right over the hill from where I lived. And um, so anyway, okay. Um, I think I'm going to wrap up this. I'm going to take you on a little journey now. Um, so what I want to do is um, the, the other question that we get all the time. What are some of your thing, some of your favorite memories, things you got to do, uh, stuff like that? So I'm going to switch over to a little slideshow I put together and... I just went through a hard drive today of some of the pictures I've got. I've got thousands of them, as you can imagine. And most of these are from, you know, a long time ago. But I'm going to give you a little glimpse into just certain little aspects. So if I can remember how to do that. Okay, you can still see me. Okay, so for the gear guys, um, when I started with Michael, um, the equipment... Let me switch back to me for a second. The, the, the gear... How to explain this? In November of 1995, when I came on board officially, I walked into a room that was filled with gear. And so as a keyboard player, it was like winning the lottery. I got to take all these keyboards and all this rack equipment, and I got to build the system that would run the entire uh, I'll Lead You Home tour. So I spent six weeks doing that, and it was a blast. And sadly... There were no digital cameras back then, so I have no pictures of what the rig looked like at first. But for the gear guys, I can describe it. It was a double-wide rack that was about the size of a double-wide refrigerator. It probably weighed, I think it was about 1,800 pounds. And it was all keyboard modules and everything. There were nine keyboards on stage. They all uh, talked to this rack over uh, cables. And... Um, it was insane. And so after the, the first leg of the Ali Home tour, I wanted to break it down and simplify a little bit. So that's where we're going to jump in. So this first picture, this is the first picture I have of that rig after I simplified it. You can see on the left, um, that was about half of the, the MIDI rig from top to bottom was a, um, uh, a Roland uh, keyboard mixer. And then below that are a pair of Yamaha uh, they were the first digital rack mount mixers. And what those would do is they would take all the signals from every keyboard on stage and off, and they would automate um, where those signals would show up. For, for, in other words, if Michael wanted to use, um, say, uh, three of the synth modules in the rack and then have those show up at his keyboard outputs, I automated all of that stuff. So I won't go through everything, but this is this, this is the, the rig... Um, after I slimmed it down. And on the right there is the computer system, which is now simply a laptop that's on stage with me. So this is kind of how far we've come. So let me switch over to the slideshow here. And okay, so this is the next version of the rig. Um, I put it in what's called a clamshell rack. It's, it's basically combining those two things into one rack that opened and closed. This was after... Uh, my first year when I started playing in the band. So I built this rig, and that system you're looking at, um, we flew that overseas uh, it, as cargo. 
and I'm not even going to tell you how much it costs, but let's just say you could buy a new car with what it costs to ship that, that system overseas to do a handful of dates in South Africa. So that's what you're looking at there. Okay, this was the rig um, in 2002 when we did uh, the Worship Again album. This was in rehearsal. Uh, so moving on. There is yours truly. <laughs> When uh, this was the same year, this was 2003 on Michael's 20th anniversary tour. Um, when I looked about 12, and uh, oh, let's see, a uh, couple years later, uh, these were the Obi Wan Kenobi years. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you could see there, I had a beard, um, and a lot of people thought that I looked like you and McGregor from Star Wars. So, um, yeah, that's contrast. That's when I looked 12. And a year later, yeah, before, after, that's crazy. <laughs> okay, this was, my, this was my rig as of 18 months ago when we did the Surrounded event in Nashville. Um, all Roland, uh, from left to right, that's the VR730. Uh, that's my organ controller with an iPad running my backstage pass control. Under that is an RD2000 digital piano, which was my main controller, and then on the right, up top is a System 8, and below that is a JDXA. So, I love that rig. That was a cool-looking rig. Um, okay, moving on. This was the way that we used to travel back in the glory days once in a while. Um, we um, used to, when we'd fly out west, we would take uh, a chartered Learjet. And I see Smitty there on the left looking at me like who knows what. And um, uh, that's our pilot. Awesome guy, Tom Tate, and uh, then it, and uh, yeah, a couple of the other guys. That was a Lear 55 you're looking at. Uh, Matt Smallbone, my brother from another mother, um, my best friends on the planet, uh, living the rock star life back in those fun days. Yours truly, getting on uh, back when I had uh, more hair. I'm not sure what was going on with the scarf, but those were the scarf days. Um, there's the inside of the Lear 55. On the left, Brent Milligan, bass player at the time. On the right, Glenn Pierce, uh, some guy in the background reading a magazine. Uh, one time, I even got to take the co-pilot chair mid-flight, which was something I'll never forget. So technically, I got to fly for a very brief time. Uh, I'll never forget that. Uh, oh my gosh, okay. One of my favorite things we've ever done. This was flying over the rim of Mount St. Helens uh, on our way out west one time. Our pilot, Tom, got clearance to, to fly us about a thousand feet over the rim, and we circled it a few times, and uh, yeah, gosh, I'll never forget that. We, we've definitely gotten to do some incredible things. So then we would go to um, Napa Valley, in California, one of my favorite spots. And we would usually get to have a day or two off there and Michael would take us on a tour of some vineyards. And I forget which one this was. I think this might've been Opus One. Um, fascinating stuff. So just a cool picture of one of the wine cellars at Opus One. And there's a dessert uh, on a gorgeous day in Napa Valley. Um, so yeah, we, we were suffering that day. Uh, and then we would end up playing at a place called the Gorge Amphitheater, where the very back of the stage would drop off hundreds of feet into this uh, canyon. And so that's the Gorge. Was, um, this was a festival called Creation West, and uh, awesome, awesome spot. And of course, no visit to the West Coast is complete without a stop at In-N-Out Burger. Okay, Raymond Boyd. One of my best buddies, uh, Raymond, <laughs> stepped off, if I remember right, he stepped off of a stage and uh, <laughs> pulled a muscle or something like that, if I remember right. So for a while, Ray was uh, immobile. And so this was running around Disney World or Epcot Center. Raymond got a cart. And, and uh, Ray, there was a time where Raymond was always a topic of conversation and always entertaining us. Um, also, Raymond in Napa Valley had never tasted wine, so uh, this was Raymond's first <laughs> first taste of wine, and we all love this picture so much, we had it made 
into a painting. So, uh, yeah, okay, here we go. Moving on. One of my favorite memories as a Star Wars junkie uh, was a week that we got to spend out at Skywalker Ranch in uh, California working on the Healing Rain record. This is a shot of the what's called the technical building. And um, back in here is the uh, scoring stage where we recorded. And, um, oh my gosh, it was... Uh, it was paradise, uh, just just being there and seeing some of the stuff that we got to see. Uh, one of the cool things about the ranch is they have bicycles everywhere, and so you can take um, you can take a bicycle and run around the ranch. And I happen to see this one, lots of fun. And of course, me and Glenn Pierce picked up sticks uh, and uh, had to have a little lightsaber battle. And I photoshopped in some lightsabers, and uh, we had our little nerd moment. So there you go. Uh, okay, another cool one. This was 2005. Um, Michael took the band up to Chicago on Bono's birthday and took us backstage to see our favorite band, U2, which was a career highlight. So we all got our passes, and we got to be fans for a day and go see U2. So there's the band uh, at the U2 concert. Uh, which was incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, one of my favorite places I've ever gotten to go is Rome. Um, we had an entire day off there, and I walked from one side of Rome to the other. My feet have never hurt so much in my life, but it was a glorious day. So, uh, shot of the Colosseum, and then in, inside the Colosseum, um, just kind of remembering some of the history that, that unfolded there, Pretty humbling. So, uh, yeah, cool spot. And uh, one of the other highlights is getting to meet certain people. Um, yes, I had black hair for a time. Um, I was dared to dye my hair. But more importantly, got to meet President Bush a few times. And this was one of the times uh, on a Christmas tour. Um, I think this was in Houston. Uh, we got to say hello to number 41. And he was an awesome human being. Uh, here's where it gets exciting. People, you know, I, t I mentioned earlier about um, how life on the road is not all glitz and glamour. This is what happens. <laughs> this was in Europe. I don't know where, but um, there's a lot of hurry up and wait on the road. And so this was, uh, there's our, our uh, old tour manager, Joey. We call him Don Cheech. He was our fearless leader for a good 20 or so years that, that I was involved. Joey's one of my best friends. And um, this is us doing what we do a lot of the time uh, on the road. So those of you who have aspirations of touring, get ready for a lot of this. And um, even more, hurry up and wait. This was a dressing room or a locker room in, I think, Barcelona. Uh, that's my buddy Michael Olson <laughs> and Ben Gal. Um, more hurry up and wait. There's yours truly. <laughs> More hurry up and wait. And uh, I think there's also a bit of jet lag going on here. So again, this is the glitz and the glamour that people don't see. And uh, yeah, lots of empty arenas that you see all day long until till folks fill it up and it ends up looking like that. So um, just a little contrast. Last couple things. Uh, life on the bus. There's a shot. More Raymond uh, this would have been somewhere around 2000, gosh, I don't know, seven, eight, maybe. Um, playing cards. That's one thing we'll do once in a while. And uh, that, I forget what that game was called, but Smitty and Raymond got so competitive and it would get, uh, it would get pretty funny. So there you go. There's a little life on the bus. Okay, back there, there's a little shot of the submarine area I was telling you about. There's the bunks, uh, top to bottom. I'm always up here. That's my spot. Smitty's always in the middle. Uh, somebody else might be down here. These days, though, we have what are called condo bunks, which are, are it's just two bunks. And so I'll be up top. Smitty be down here. Hopefully I'm not giving away secrets. And then uh, there's a couple more in the back. And then there's a whole bunch on this side. So that's life on the bus. Um, highlight, playing at Billy Graham events. This was the last one he did. I can't remember. Actually, I don't think this was the last one but it was close to then. Um, those were absolutely incredible. Uh, there was a shot of the crowd 
those things would be typically 90 to 100,000 people, depending on the event. So, um, yeah, awesome. And uh, in no other particular order, I personally love going to Africa. Um, I just love Africa. It's an incredible place, especially when you get to go on a safari. Those are some of my favorite memories. I got to play with lion cubs. There's uh, yours truly holding a lion cub. This guy was about six weeks old at the time. And let me tell you, those paws could do some damage. Um, that didn't last for very long. I got to hold him for maybe 30 seconds and then he wanted to get down. So, but yeah, that was a highlight. Um, I think this is the last one. Um, one of the, my other favorite memories ever in all these years is this surrounded event we did, uh, in August of 2018, uh, at the Bridgestone in Nashville. This was an event like no other. We, uh, we packed 18,000 people in there. And it was um, it was a time of uh, prayer for the for the city, for the country, for for the world. Um, I think that event changed a lot of things for a lot of people, and I don't think any of us will ever forget it. So, um, yeah, that's that's just something that um, that that nobody will ever forget. So, there you go. Um, I think that's uh, that's probably enough for tonight. We've we've gone an uh, hour and fifteen minutes, I think. Um, I hope this was fun for you guys. Uh, there was no no music involved tonight, um, which I hope is okay. Um, maybe let's see. Anything you want to hear? Um, no, I'm not going to do any music tonight. We'll we'll save that for another time. Um, so again, I would just say thank you for, for taking part in these. It's, it is fun for us to do these. It's, it's a, you know, a way of connecting with you and hopefully encouraging you. I hope this one was a fun look behind the curtain, so to speak. Um, hopefully I've, I've answered uh, a lot of your, your questions. Oh, I just happened to glance over it. Was that the Chicago U2 show that was released on DVD? It actually was. We were there on one of the two nights that they recorded that, and it was Bono's birthday. And so, yeah, it was awesome to be able to be there. Um, claustrophobic on those bunks. Not, not as much as you would think. There's a lot of space in those bunks. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, it's not like a queen-size bed, I'll tell you that. So, anyway, it, it's been good hanging out with you. Um, not sure exactly what the next episode will be. I'm going to get back to more technical stuff for the gear guys. Um, I'll just give you a little, you know, glimpse though. I've already got um, some topics picked out. I'm going to do some stuff on, um, you know, we did keyboards and stuff last week. I'm going to do one on uh, digital audio workstations. I'm going to do one on my favorite uh, virtual instrument plugins. Uh, I'm going to do one just dedicated to um, effects processing, to reverbs. Excuse me. I'm big on... Um, uh, different flavors of reverb. So I'm going to take you on a tour of some of my favorites and let you hear uh, why they're important and and why what works on one source might not work on another and so on. So, uh, And then I'm going to do one on Backstage Pass. I'm going to tell you the history of it. Um, I'm going to tell you the future of it a little bit. And I'm going to bring in Blair Masters and interview him live. Um, so we'll do some episodes on bringing in guests. And I think some of those will be fun. And one on music production, one on recording. There's there's a lot to come, but uh, anyway, that's just a little uh, taste of what's gonna what's gonna come. So if you're watching this on Facebook, again, please hit subscribe. Um, if you're on my Facebook page right now, again, please hit like. Oh, I forget whether it's like or follow, whichever one. That would be awesome. That way you can you'll know when there's more coming. Um, once again, I'd like to thank Roland for for supplying us with. Uh, uh, the VR one HD for streaming makes a big difference and, um, thank Yamaha for their unwavering support over all these years with keyboards and, uh, band gear and, and Roland also for band gear. Uh, anyway, enough. I really appreciate you guys. We do not take for granted what we get to do. And, uh, I've become friends with so many of you. And I think Michael would say the same thing that, that, um, that's one of the coolest parts of getting to do this is that um, we've got to actually form relationships with people. And, and that is what really means a lot. So 
Uh, thank you for your all, uh, your unwavering encouragement and support over the years. And I uh, hope we get to see you all soon. And uh, so, yeah, keep the questions coming. And um, I think we'll just about wrap it up. So hope you all have a good night. And um, we will uh, talk to you soon. So, all right, we'll see you. Have a good one.